Good morning, everyone. Class is recorded. Welcome to today's session on the book of Esther. So before we could start our class, we will start a class with a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you, we praise you, we love you, we honor you, we glorify your name, Lord. Thank you for this new day, the beautiful day that you have blessed each one of us, O oh Father. Lord, I pray that you, you will bless each one of us with your grace, with your strength to lead this day. And more than anything, Lord, we ask for your favor to cover us, to overshadow us in all the area of our life. Thank you, Lord, for doing it so. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And uh, before we can begin with our class, I'll just share the presentation with us. Okay, I hope everyone can see this. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the confirmation. So the book of Esther. So what do we know about the book of Esther? I'm sure each of us have, would have heard the story of Esther or would, some of us would have had a chance to watch the movie of Esther. But what do we know about the book of Esther or the person individual? Anyone from the class? Sid, what do you know about Esther, Divya, Georgia, Hamilton? What do you all hear about Esther? Ma'am, may I? Yes, please. Ma'am, in the book of Esther, it is written that the small biography which I know about Esther, that she was an orphan. Mm-hmm. She was a Jew and she was the nephew of Mordecai, niece of the Mordecai. Mm -hmm. And Mordecai, Mordecai made her grew up as her as his, as her own daughter. Mm -hmm. And later she was married to the king of King Exodus in replace of her king, Queen Vesti. And she she her, she did a great job and she had a very great history in protecting the people of the Jewish community from the bad guy Naman. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Haman. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Okay. Anyone else from a class? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the I love the verse, uh, Esther 414, in which Mordecai says to Esther, for if you remain completely silent at this time, Relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet you, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Yeah, yeah, this is a verse which I really love in this book. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you, Divya. That's one of the key verse, and and it is very important. Speaks a lot, and we can also apply it in in our uh, in our situ many of our situations like god has called us for a reason and god has called us for such a time as this just like the way god called esther anyone else any other women in the class who have read this book of esther and were inspired by the life of esther Anita, Georgia. Okay, let's start with our class. So the book of Esther is one and more interesting book in the Bible. As it is also the last book in the historical books of the Bible. So its main character is named and this book is named after the main character, Esther. Esther means, in Persian language, it means a star, which denotes the star Venus, the morning star. 
which shines brighter after all the other stars have dimmed. Thus, the deeds of Queen Esther, which was uh, cast a ray or the light of hope into the Israel's history during this dark season. The author, when we talk, look into the author, the author is unknown, but some biblical scholars say that it may be Mordecai himself who, who would have written this book. Well, the date and time. The event in this book took place uh, approximately between 483 BC to 473 during the first half of the reign of King uh, Xerxes or Ahasuerus. The background, let's look into the background of the story. The story is set uh, uh, over 100 years after the Babylonian exile of the Israelites from their land. While some Jews did return to Jerusalem, like uh, remember Ezra and Nehemiah, which we discussed in the last class, many returned along with them. But there were still some of the Jews who stayed back in the exile. So the book of Esther is about the Jewish community living in the land of Susa, which was the capital city of the ancient uh, Persian Empire. Well, at this time, the Persian Empire was one of the largest empire the world had ever seen. It covered, uh, it covered <clears throat> about 127 provinces. For example, in today's, uh, uh, in today's name, we call it Turkey, Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, or uh, Jordan, Lebanon, and Israel, and also parts of the modern-day Egypt, Sudan, Libya, Arabia, and also we see the name of India been mentioned. So this king, uh, you know, was in control of these large provinces of 127. Also, at this time, Ezra had returned to Jerusalem after it had been uh, conquered by the Babylonian and the temple has been rebuilt uh, maybe 30 years before. So the important character in this book we get to study is, uh, let's look into the characters of this uh, book so that uh, keeping them in our mind, we can understand the story much easily. So we get to see uh, the one main character as the king, King Azasuris. While some historians compare King Azazarus to Cambys, son of Cyrus, or as a son of uh, Darius the Mede, the tradition identifies him as a pretender to the throne. Now, why? He gained the power through deceit and bribery. No matter, we're not very sure about this information. This is what uh, some of the scholars and the traditions say that. But no matter how this king achieved his kingship, but he ruled over a vast kingdom. Yet the Megillah, that is one of the Hebrew scripture, itself shows us what sort of ruler he was. He was a ruler out of control. It is apparent that he was easily swayed by the opinion of others around him. In the first chapter, when we read, we see that he demand uh, when the when the ministers around him demands uh, for Vasti to appear with her beauty, he granted their opinion. And later, when she refused to come in front of him, and again, when the ministers around him said, you need to banish her from the kingdom, again, he gave heed. He just listened to the people around him. Later part, we see Haman, uh, who was a prime minister, the second in command in his kingdom, um, you know, plotted against Mordecai. And so with his own story, he goes and approaches the king. And without even reasoning the facts, he gives him the sig a signet ring to approve, uh, to demolish the Jews. Without even king's knowledge, he gets a, sing uh, a signet ring to approve this kind of plot against Jews. So he was, uh, in fact, it is even the... Uh, um, So uh, even when after we see uh, the same kind of nature being continued when Esther came into his life uh, uh, again, 
he started listening to Esther. But thank God that Esther was in uh, was a wise woman who could uh, give him the right kind of advice. And later we see another character in this book as Vasti. By marrying Vasti, Azasuris misused his right to the throne. Vasti was the daughter of Balshadzer the last Babylonian king was defeated by Darius and Cyrus and the great granddaughter of King Nebuchadnezzar who destroyed the first holy temple and Jerusalem which we looked into the book of Chronicles and the kings. So as a descendant of this evil line, Vasti was also uh, not uh, much less but then she was also wicked in her thoughts and in her morality. The Midrash, the Hebrew scripture also teaches us that while she was only 12, a father, a father was murdered by uh, Darius, the king Darius, the Medes. And she was about 18 years uh, when, uh, when um, king, king Azasaris invited her to come and show her beauty to the people around her. So she was very bold enough to say no to the king and refused and we know the story after that what happens we will get to know it later so according to some tradition source says that queen vasti used to force the jewish maid servants who were uh, under the bonded slavery there during her time who were serving under her she used to make them to scrub the palace floor on the shabbat where uh, for the jews that day was holy they're not supposed to do any kind of work on that day but then she didn't allow them to keep up that shabbat but then she uh, intended to give much more work on that and we will look into the next character, Mordecai, a descendant of King Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. Mordecai was a prophet and a member of the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court in Jerusalem before the exile. He was also considered as one of the greatest Torah leaders of his generation. And um, the Jews in exile looked to him for his guidance along with Queen Esther. And we will move on to the next, the main character or after which the book has been named after her, uh, that is Esther. Esther, who lost her parents at a very young age. And she was adopted by a cousin, Mordecai, who took care of her just like his own daughter. She possessed she possessed exceptional beauty. Yes, I'll come to that point. Sir. She possessed ex uh, exceptional beauty. She was very beautiful. And the actual name of Esther in Hebrew was Hadassah, which means myrtle branch. And before she, uh, when the when the king called out for the young virgins for the beauty contest for him to select one one person as his queen. When Esther was about to go, Mordecai gave her uh, some instruction. He changed her name from Adasa to Esther. And also he gave her some instructions telling her, do not let yourself, uh, let anyone know that you are a Jew. He gave her this instruction and sent her. And the next character we will um, look into is Haman. Haman, uh, Haman, sorry, Haman or Amen. We can call his name as Haman as well. So Haman has been introduced in uh, Megillah. Uh, Megillah is again the Hebrew scripture that I said. Uh, Haman was an a Hagite, or he's from the Amalekite tribe, referring to his lineage as a descendant of King Haga. Haga was the last king of Amalekites, the national uh, arch enemy of the Jewish people. While the Amalekite nation was destroyed by King Samuel, which we saw in the book of uh, uh, First Samuel, 
Saul disobeyed God's command and had mercy on King Hagar, allowing him to live. And then when uh, Prophet Samuel heard about it, he was furious and he killed Hagar himself. But the damage was already been done by King Hagar. He had enough of time to sow the seeds about, uh, about Jews to his future generation. So Haman, who's from the same uh, tribe, he carried hatred towards Jews. He wants to destroy them, annihilate them completely. And he was married to a woman named Zeresh. And she was equally wicked as Haman. She hated Jews to the core. And both had the same kind of vision in their life to destroy Jews completely, abolish them from the face of this earth. And they had 10 sons and one daughter. And yes. We also covered Zeres, Haman's wife. So with this, we will move on to chapter 1 from our Bible. Can we turn to chapter 1 from our Bible? So the book of Esther opens with a description of an enormous of 180-day party thrown by King Ahasuerus in his third year as king of Persian Empire. He ruled over, how many provinces did he rule? By 127. Yes, 127 provinces he ruled. And as the day of feasting draw to close, he summons his wife. He called out for his wife, Vasti, as there was a great demand from his ministers to show off a beauty among them. But Vasti refuses to come. And uh, we see how King was uh, very furious at, uh, at, uh, at Vasti's act. And uh, listening to all the ministers, he, uh, he banishes her from the kingdom. So as the time passed, Azazarus realized the consequence of his action and he misses his queen. Now the deed, however, is done, seeing that the rulers also regretted for the action that was suggested by them. So now they come up with a new idea or a new proposal to the king, saying that let's find a new queen for the king. So they come up with a suggestion, let's uh, you know, have a beauty contest of all the uh, beautiful uh, virgins from this uh, kingdom, from all over 127 provinces. So all the beautiful women are being brought to the palace and the king gets to select his new queen. So even before he could select, there is a process. Okay, there's a process that uh, each and everyone had to go through, and then he get, uh, then they will meet the king, and when the king meets each and everyone, then he finalizes the queen, and we see how God can use an ordinary people to do extraordinary things uh, in the story as it unveils. Yes, we also saw uh, in the book of Genesis how God uh, brought Joseph into the kingdom out of, you know, uh, from the desert, God raised him to become the prime minister, the second in command to Pharaoh. And here we see a slave Jewish girl. How God orchestrate things for Esther in her life. So in Shusan, a capital city, lived a beautiful Jewish girl named, what was her name? What was her Hebrew name? Adasha. Adasha. Okay. She is an orphan. She lost her parents at a very young age and she was raised by her uncle Mordecai. Okay. One was on the leader of the Jewish people in the exile. When they uh, came to take her to the palace, Mordecai instructs uh, Esther not to reveal her identity that she was a Jew and this is a family detail. It's not to reveal anything 
even to the fellow girls who were with her or to the eunuchs who would be training or to anyone in the palace. Just keep it to herself. So we see God had placed a right kind of mentor in her life to speak wisdom, to teach her in her life. Because Mordecai was a leader and he knew how people around him hated Jews. They were waiting to destroy. So Esther takes her uncle's advice, advice and she goes to this contest. Uh, the long story short, she finds favor. We see that Esther in chapter 2, she finds favor in king's eyes. Can one of us please turn to chapter 2, verse 17 and read? The king loved Esther more than all the women, and she found favor and kindness with him more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her, and made her queen instead of Vasti. Yes, yes, thank you. There were about 1,400 people who competed with Esther and they had to go 147 days of process to, to prepare themselves to uh, even before they could appear before the king. And and here God, you know, uh, put a favor over Esther. So whoever looked at Esther, she found favor in their sight. She found favor with the eunuch. She found favor with the fellow uh, girls who came there. She found favor finally with the king himself. And he appointed her as the queen. And he placed the royal crown on her head and made her the queen instead of Vasti. So what we learn from this act? A simple young girl who was so insignificant in that in that place. She was a stranger in that land. And now she's been raised to become a queen of the same land. In the same way, our past should not dictate our future. An orphan girl, one who lost her parents, was raised to be the queen in the strange land, God changed her destiny and you know, and blessed her. Same God is faithful enough to change our destiny and make us, uh, you know, and bless us in the place where we are. So while Mordecai does not reveal his uh, relationship to the uh, to the new queen, he fervents, he always uh, is frequently is near the palace, the palace gates to hear the news of Esther's well-being, how she's doing. He does not leave her, but then he keeps inquiring of her, how is she doing, how is her welfare, he has a check over her. So one day, he happens to overhear two men plotting to murder the king and uh, he quickly sends out a word to Esther to reveal the plot of the king in the name of Mordecai. The plotters were caught and executed and Mordecai's name and deed were written in the king's book of chronicles. But yeah, we will cover that part later. So we go towards chapter 3. Now in chapter 3, uh, we see king appoints Amen and Amalekite as a prime minister and issues a degree that all should bow to him. But Mordecai refuses to bow down before Amen. The Midras, that is the Hebrew scripture, informs us that Haman wore a necklace which, were, which had a large idol on it. And uh, for which one of the reasons, the tradition says, maybe for one of the reasons for which Mordecai did, refused to bow before him. But uh, uh, Mordecai's refusal started irritating Haman. Being a Jew, you're being a slave in our place and you're not bowing down to me. So this disrespect you know, irritated, uh, uh, created, uh, uh, created uh, so much of hatred towards uh, Mordecai and the Jews, where Haman and his family started planning a plot to uh, to 
kill Mordecai and the Jews along with him. So now Haman goes to King Azasuerus and asks for permission to destroy the Jews and he presents him 10,000 silver pieces and, and also <clears throat> he issues the king as a matter of a loyalty and he says, uh, if one of us can turn to chapter 3 verse 8. <clears throat> Esther chapter 3 verses 8. Then Haman said to King Exodus, There is a certain people dispersed and scattered among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom, whose customs are different from those of all other people and who do not obey king's law. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so, King. Uh, without even reasoning or inquiring, he just agrees and issues an edict to all 127 provinces saying that on the 13th of Adar, the Jews in all the provinces are to be exterminated and their property as kept as a plunder. In chapter 4, we see that upon hearing this veil edict, Mordecai, uh, you know, wears a sackcloth and ashes and he moans. And he quickly sends a word to Esther that she must go to the king and stop this horrible degree and, uh, from becoming a reality. And Esther is afraid. She cannot approach the king just like that whenever she wanted unless and until she's been called by the king. And if anyone approaches the king, even before that he could summon or call them, they will be put to death. There's a lot of chances for them to be put to death. But Mordecai sees the bigger picture and tells Esther, you have to do. You have to take a stand. Can I request one of us to please uh, take up chapter 4, verse 13 and 14? Chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. Should yeah, you can gather. Get, uh, yeah, you can continue 16 also. Go gather all the Jews who are present in Sushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Mordecai is a man of faith, if you see here. He was a man of faith. He clearly instructed Esther, see, you're in power for such a time as this. If you do not do it, God will definitely raise somebody else because it is a matter of Jews. It is a matter of God's people. It's just not me, your uncle, but it is a whole community. Haman is, uh, you know, uh, plotting this to kill and um, wipe out the complete Jewish people from the face of this earth. So if you don't respond, God will definitely raise somebody else because God is a promise keeper. Mordecai had faith on God and he honored him. And he knew that God has an eternal covenant with Abraham and David towards his people. And so... Um, Esther been encouraged by her uncle. Uh, so with God's help, with God's help, she also steps out in faith to fight her fears. We see that, uh, you know, uh, the verse 16, where she says, uh, uh, where, where she is asking uh, to fast for three days. She is sending, uh, she is instructing uh, Mordecai uh, to inform all the Jews to fast and pray for three days where she and her maid also will do it so that she can go and 
stand before king and she will find favor in front of king that god will give her that favor in king's sight she knew her god she trusted that god will strengthen her though um, you know throughout the book we do not see the name of god in it but we see how god orchestrate things we see that esther you know uh, fasted for 3 days and then she goes she goes uh, with great fear in chapter 5 we see that with great fear she she dresses beautifully with all her strength she dresses uh, she dresses and she wears one of the beautiful robe she adorns herself and goes to meet the king as she approaches king azasurus and here she walks towards the throne and she prays within her that god take into account for the three days of fasting which is not recorded but yes the whole uh, meaning of this three days fast is to seek god's favor so as she goes and stands in front of king the king uh, uh, holds out that golden scepter as a sign that he is welcoming her into the court into a into his presence she touches and goes and uh, the king asks what is your request i may grant it so esther requests that king and his prime minister haman joins her to a private feast and this pleased the king and he said i will be there so king agrees and he goes with haman to queen's place to dine together at the end of the feast again the uh, king asks esther ask whatever you wanted i will give it to you even half of the kingdom but queen esther a woman of wisdom she was calm even during this time she was very calm she just told king that please join me for the second feast with haman again and again it was approved so after the private feast of the day one haman sets out you know he, he he as he was passing his home he sees mordecai when the other people bow down before uh okay there are some images i've got here we see other other people you know when they bow down before amen but mordecai is not this again stirred him up he became very furious and with this anger he goes to his home and he plots against uh, he plots uh, uh, plots along with his wife and chill, uh, with the other ministers whom he has he plots to uh, kill mordecai so what he does he builds a huge gallon with the help of his 10 sons and he says next day morning even before i'm uh, even before i could go to the queen's uh, uh, feast i'll make sure that i will uh, put mordecai to death and then i will go as this was there in uh, haman's mind that night we see king lost his sleep king is struggling to sleep and when he could not sleep we are in chapter 6 when the uh, when the king was unable to sleep he was tossing and turning and he finally called his ministers to bring him the book of chronicles and read it to him and here we see that god's timing is so perfect so perfect one side haman has decided to put mordecai to death and one side god is orchestrating the king to reward mordecai of the good deed that he has forgotten to reward and as the ministers were reading and recalling the great service rendered uh, they also reminded that uh, mordecai who saved king's life 
and then he also rea realizes that he uh, he was never rewarded for this good deed so just as um, uh, so king decided to call uh, to call Haman in the next day morning and instruct uh, Haman to reward a person who has done a good deed and to give him the best reward. So uh, the king calls Amen and he discusses with Amen. Uh, uh, he discusses like how the king can reward a manor with uh, with the best honor and uh, most uh, 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 who was most loyal to him. So uh, Haman thinks that it is king is talking about him because he was most of the time he was so self-centered. So even this time that he thought uh, maybe for the service that he is rendering to the king. So he thought king is talking about him to reward him. So he suggests that the king would dress the person in king's finest robe and have him led around the city, around the town. Uh, in king's horse and uh, pleased with the and uh, king was pleased with his suggestion so he orders uh, him in to dress mordecai in the finest royal robes and lead him around shusan the city and uh, haman uh, was regretting for this but then because it's the king's command he did it King lost the sleep and he was reading and this is the gallon which was prepared for Mordecai and here we see Mordecai being seated on the horse and Haman was taking him in the city of Susa and after that uh, King summoned summoned to call Haman but before he could go that uh, go uh, Zeris, his wife. Zeris, his wife, who said to Haman, saying that if um, I, I am just reading that scripture, one second, please. I'll read it to you. So Zeris is uh, uh, telling Haman from uh, verse 13, verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 13. When Haman told his wife Zeris and all his friends everything that had happened to him, his wise men and his wife Zeris said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descendant, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. It is like, you know, his own wife prophesying against him, saying that your fall has been started. Your fall is started. Exactly like how she said. Yes, Mordecai started, God started changing. The tables were turned, started exalting Mordecai, and Haman was uh, humiliated. So, after returning home, uh, when the king sent the minister to call Haman for the queen's feast, Haman rushes to be with the king at the feast. Now, as the banquet, uh, they are part of the banquet, and as uh, this feast comes to a close, Esther tells the king that someone seeks her death and the death of her people. This was a shocking news to the king. In fact, he was the one who actually gave his ring to sign, but he was not aware. And uh, this news was shocking, and king demanded to know who was this man, and Esther reveals his identity. Uh, Esther reveals her identity to the king, that she is a Jew, and identifies Haman as an opponent enemy who actually is trying to kill me and my people. And the uh, king was angered with this very act and he go he steps out from that feast to the garden. And when he came back, he saw that Haman was on the couch with the uh, queen pleading for his life. But the, the very sight that he was next to the queen uh, made, uh, made a king very upset. So we see that in chapter 7, verse 7, that he arose, the king arose in his wrath and the banquet and wine went into 
uh, the place of garden. But Haman stood before Queen Esther, pleading for his life, for he saw the evil was determined against him by the king. When the king returned from the palace garden to the place of banquet of wine, Haman had fallen across the couch where Esther was. Then the king said, Will he also assault the queen while I am in the house? And as the word left king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. And in uh, verse 9, we see that uh, Harbona, one of uh, the eunuchs, said to the king, Look, the gallows, which is 50 cubits high, which Haman uh, made, for Mordecai, uh, so immediately to kill Mordecai. This is what the eunuch told the king, and the immediately king told him, hang him on that, hang him on it. And as per his command, Haman was hanged on that gallow. And then, uh, uh, again in verse 8, we see how Esther and Mordecai tries to save the Jews and Mordecai has come to the power. Uh, king makes Mordecai, <clears throat> Esther reveals that Mordecai is an uncle and uh, he found finds favor in king's sight and he's been raised as the prime minister. And then both Esther and her uncle uh, um, see how sees to it how they can save the Jews from all the place. And the king gives the control to them and gives the ring. And he says, y'all issue, uh, I cannot reverse the decree that has been sent. But then uh, Mordecai and Esther uh, finds a way so that the Jews can save themselves. They say they ask them to prepare for a battle, face and kill all the opponents, whoever whoever's trying to kill the Jews. And in that way, they, fry, uh, uh, they try to defend their, themselves and they try to kill all the Jews who try to kill them. And in this way, and also um, Esther and Mordecai said, all the ten sons who planned to kill Mordecai, will hang on the same, Will they were killed and then they were hang on the gallon uh, itself. And we see the hand of God here. We see the hand of God here. Uh, Mordecai, a simple man, helpless man, who only trusted on, on God. We see that in uh, Zechariah. Can I request one of us to please turn to Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Can one of us read? Zechariah chapter 2 verse 8 and 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, he sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them and they shall become spoiled for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Thank you. Thank you. You see, God says, you are the apple of my eye and whoever comes against me, I will raise my hand against them. See, Jews are always God's delight. Jews are always God's delight, even though they did not obey even though they did not obey them, but there was a faithful man, one person, Mordecai, who prayed and asked God to help. And uh, big God heard his prayer. And whoever planted a evil against Mordecai and uh, and uh, destroying the Jews were killed. And they were also hanged on this gallon, especially the Haman and his two sons were hanged and others were killed and destroyed in that battle which they had uh, fixed so the one who plotted evil, that evil came upon them itself because the very intention of them was not right. And they were not trying only to fight against the Jews, but they were trying to fight against the God of Israel, the God whom who, who, who desires, who delights in Israel. So God will never... Uh, forsake his people, even though they would have forgotten. Our God is a God, a covenant keeper, is a protector. He has many plans to restore Israel until they is, he is in control and he is with them. He is fighting for them. So this is the place. The, uh, these are the people, the Jews, the Israelites are the people who, who have God himself with them. So the same God is with us. We are never alone. 
we are never alone in despite our situation despite the battle or circumstances that we face in our life god is with us he fights our battle also be um, be sure that we are the apple of his eye if anyone plans anything against us against us just like the word says no weapon fashioned against us shall prosper and also god himself will fight our battle when we trust on him he his hand will be against it against the situation against the evil against the enemy that trying to destroy or trying to uh, uh trying to uh, destroy his children so we see that mordecai also organizes a particular practice uh, to commemorate this whole event they called it as holiday of purim what is purim pur means lot where uh, in the story when we read in detail we get to see that haman had put lot to find out a day when he can completely uh, annihilate uh, uh, completely destroy the jews and mordecai so um, on the same day so mordecai names that day as purim for him a uh, a uh, a uh, uh, feast of lots which fell on good for them so they celebrated this festival with great meals gifts of food and they did lot of charity to the poor the day uh, before purim one day before that they come uh, they fasted to commemorate uh, <clears throat> esther's three days of fasting through uh, through one brave act of esther we see that how she impacted the generation so in the same way even we can impact for generation when we step in with god so here we see the shadow of christ in this book just like how esther uh, like christ puts herself in the place of death for her people as she said if i perish i perish but receives the approval of the king she also portrays christ's work as an advocate on our behalf This book reveals <clears throat> another satanic threat to destroy the Jewish people, and thus the messianic line may be gone. But God continues to preserve His people, in spite of the opposition and the danger what was ahead of them. And nothing can prevent the coming of Messiah. So, in con in conclusion, the message was clear that God is sovereign. even though his name was not mentioned in the whole book but we see the sovereign power of god in the life of each one we see the sovereignty and this faithfulness of god permeates throughout the book so we covered most of these events and then the reflection do we trust in god even when god protects protective hand is not visible do we have the courage to speak up for what we believe and are we willing to suffer the consequence of doing so more than anything i would ask the question like do we trust god even when things are not very favorable to us and can we trust on god's protective hand upon us it may not we may not see the supernatural things happening around us but then god's hand is always upon us he orchestrates things nothing is out of control but god is in control and we have his favor and we need to trust that this is one of my learning from this book and if anyone would like to share your learning from this book please feel free and go ahead what was your learning from this book brother isaac zeli yes brother yes brother yeah i learned that out of the word that your labor in the lord is not in vain yes yes uh, as sacrificed for our people and she was elevated at the table for the lord thank you Thank you. Thank you, brother. Lia Zeli.
Okay, there's a very interesting question of Sid here. Uh, when King accepted Queen Esther's proposal, then why she skipped it second day? Why she didn't told King about the evil desire of Haman and she did not second day? King might have killed Haman before. See, this is what we may think King might have killed uh, Haman before, but there's always God's timing. There's always, you know, she prayed and she had this wisdom. And always it creates a curiosity when you put things delay, when you delay things, you don't uh, tell it. What if, uh, if I or you would have been first time itself, we would have said even before inviting King to a feast, we would have just uh, said the minute she found favor in King's sight and, you know, he put down the golden scepter for her to enter in. She would have just told what is happening towards her and her people. But she invited the King to the feast. She, she created a curiosity in the king so that a request will be fulfilled. A request uh, will not uh, uh, have any other counter effect against it. And it worked out for her in the way she thought, she planned, she decided how she'll put it across. She was a woman of wisdom and of patience at the same time. Yes, Divya. Divya says Esther's wisdom, humility and self-sacrifice stands out in the story. Yes. And Zelis is inspired by the Mordecai's faith. Very true. Very true. Yes, we need to have faith, a God kind of faith could bring in miracle into our life, which could move giants, which could move mountains and allow God to do work. So we need to have faith. We need to trust God. Only then God can work in and through us and intervene into the situation and change our situation in favor or in favor of us. So with this, can I request one of us to please lead us in prayer? Yes, said Esther used a power position for the protection of God's people and plan. Yes, you're right. Thank you. Thank you. Can I request Zeli to lead us in prayer and dismiss us, please? Okay. Father God, we thank you so much for this session. Lord, we thank you for teaching us with the life story of Esther and with the faith of Mordecai, Lord. Help us to be faithful, Lord. No matter what, help us to trust in you, Lord, to depend on you, no matter what the situation, no matter what situation goes in our life, Lord. And uh, Lord, whatever we have learned, Holy Spirit, continue on to teach us so that we can put that practically in our life, Lord. You bless our uh, name and all our classmates, Lord, as we disperse from this place, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining in today's session. See you all tomorrow. God bless. God bless.